Hello and welcome to another episode of Age Educational Podcast. I'm Roy. I'm Terry. So, you know, this podcast, uh, it's, uh, we've just started it here recently, and what we're trying to do is bring you information on aging. Uh, we're bringing you information for the aging themselves, for their caregivers, for adult children, and uh, for some of us that are in the aging process to try to help us age better. So today we are fortunate enough to have Dr. Judy Ford with us. Uh, she grew up in Sydney and studied science at the University of Sydney. She obtained her first class honors degree in biology and genetics in 1967 and a PhD in 1971. Her postdoctoral work in embryology, then 25 years in clinical cyt cytogenics, <laughs> motivated her research into the mechanisms of aging <laughs> and the pre prevention of age-related dise diseases. Because of the complexity of biology and medicine, people tend to become experts in one field. It's difficult to transcend fields and link and make sense out of cross-disciplinary knowledge. Judy's knowledge of genetics, cell biology, physiology, biochemistry, and public health have helped her to uh, make sense in the de disparate research in aging. Judy is now enjoying being semi-retired and she is uh, writing and speaking on the research topics that uh, most inspire her. And her current books she has are why We Age, and she has a workbook, Why We Age, that, the Why We Age workbook that goes with that. So, Judy, thanks so much for uh, joining us today. And I must say, your, uh, your uh, bio ranks as one of the top with the longest, <laughs> hardest words in it so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about the words. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I even read through that a few times just to make sure I could say them. <laughs> Oh, no, no. Well, thanks so much. So um, talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, what got you to what inspired you to write the Why We Age and uh, can, uh, can walk us through what that goes through, what that entails. All right. So why I was, in, well, I was inspired to write Why We Age because I'd done a lot of research and I'd published quite a few papers over the years. But, you know, um, in the last 10 years of my employment, I was working as a, as a lecturer to PhD students, teaching them how to be better PhD students. Mm. And I wasn't getting very many opportunities to do research. And really these days to get people to really notice your research work, you have to write a lot of papers that are really almost on the same thing. So you, when you look at the literature and you look at papers by person A who's done very well, you see that actually there's a real, there's a quite a lot of overlap between their papers. Now, now, I wasn't in a position to do that, but I had figured out, I thought, um, with the help of other people's data and all sorts of things, um, a lot of the mechanisms of ageing that really weren't translating into other people's knowledge you know so i felt that in order to try and get my whole thinking together i needed to write a book and and then i had to try and think who is my audience and and that is a little bit of a problem because i think my audience are for the at least for the first part of the book um my audience is is people who have some sort of science or health background okay. who know some of the words and who who appreciate the whole sort of genre. Although I have to say that in the past year with COVID, um, everyone seems to be uh, hearing all these huge words that I wouldn't dare to give people. And, and, uh, and I think there's probably at least a greater expectation that, that people will understand many of the words that I've been trying to sort of pussyfoot around and, and simplify. Right. <clears throat> anyway, I was also asked to give some talks here to a group called the University of the Third Age. And so those are, a lot of the people who attend those uh, meetings are people who have had various sorts of science backgrounds. And so I felt that they, they were people who would be able to understand this. Okay. But 
So the first part of the book um, attempts to explain about cells and cell division and what actually go, happens in the aging process and why indeed aging is inevitable. You know, so we, we, we start as one cell and then now cells are going to divide you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times and at various stages in our body we'll have millions and millions and millions of cells, some of which is a destruct, you know, self-destructing every day um, and so basically the end is is inevitable because we're going to run out of cells okay um, so that cells have a limited capacity to divide and that you know one day one day there just won't be any capacity left yeah and and in an ideal situation where we're very very healthy um, we'll just be a, a smaller, maybe probably smaller, um, less active version of ourselves, and then we'll die in our sleep if we could avoid all those age related diseases. But the aging process itself um, produces high levels of what we know is called inflammation, but this inflammation itself is the thing that really causes our downfall. And so my book is a lot about how to reduce inflammation. Okay. But um, so the first part of the book is, is the theory and it's putting together my thoughts, um, my published work and the published work of other people to create sort of a whole theory of, of aging. And then the rest of the book, um, I actually look at a, a website called, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of the website again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the World Statistics, um, and it's data from 182 countries of the, the border of the countries in, in deaths. Um, so, you know, which, which of the top, which, of, which country has the the highest rate of deaths from cardiovascular disease and, and then which country has the lowest rate. And so from looking at that information and, and then just going in personally and looking at the lifestyles of the people in those countries and comparing it with what's already been published in the scientific literature, I have tried to figure out what are the major, not, not probably the only, but the major causes and the major preventative things for each of these um, top killers and, and make some suggestions of how, in addition to everything else I say, how you might make your life healthier and, and more and you'll live longer. Right. And, live longer in a better, healthier state. Yeah, and it's funny you bring up so, inflammation yeah. because, uh, you know, the more that we talk about this, the, sub in the subject of aging, but also, you know, things that go wrong with this, with cancer and with other things, it, it all seems to lead back to uh, inflammation is mm -hmm. really yeah. a huge catalyst for most of the things that go wrong with us. That's right. And inflammation is caused primarily, um, so there are some other factors, but the primary cause is our cells reaching what is called their telomere limit. Now, so <clears throat> we, we've heard about telomeres, we've heard about telomerase, and so we've heard about people getting paid, paid Nobel Prizes for discovering telomerase. We've heard about some people spruiking telomerase as something you should take to extend your telomeres, which I think is a seriously bad idea. Um, but so the so if we go back to basics, the end of the ends of our chromosomes have got little knobs on them. And these little knobs are telomeres. And when I first started doing genetics, um, we'd only just heard about telomeres and we thought that they were to stop chromosomes from ends from sticking to one another. Anyway, gradually over the years, it's turned out that the telomeres have an important role in the spatial elements of cells. Anyway, 
Um, but they also have an important role in DNA replication. And so every time a cell divides, prior to that division, all the chromosomes have to replicate their DNA. Wow. And the telomere is an essential component of being able to replicate the DNA. But in replicating the DNA, uh, because of the process isn't quite perfect, a little bit of the telomere gets chopped off. And so you can only have so many pieces of your telomeres chopped off in any cell before that cell becomes defunct and can't divide anymore. Okay. And so um, once the telomere is, is chopped off, that cell ha has two possible things that can happen to it. It can either undergo a process called apoptosis, where it self-destructs and all the sort of goodies, the elements are recycled, you know, like breaking down a food and recycling everything that was in it. Um, but that's one of, one of the processes. But the other process, which is probably the one that dominates, um, the cell becomes senescent. So it stays in the system, unable to divide, unable to take up um, the important sort of fatty acids. Well, it cannot take some, some elements of nutrition, but it can't convert what are known as the short chain fatty acids into the healthier long chain fatty acids. And then the cell becomes senescent and in this senescent sort of state with its rigid membranes, it becomes highly inflammatory. And, and so then um, the body is then concerned with trying to deal with the inflammation that's created by having all these stagnant sort of elderly cells. Um, and so I have to give one of my most important messages at this stage, and that is that it's really one of the most important components of cell membranes um, is the conversion through to oleic acid. So it's stearic acid to oleic acid. And oleic acid is the major component of olive oil. And so all of these things that recognize the Mediterranean diet as being important. There are various aspects of the Mediterranean diet that are important, but probably the key element is the high intake of olive oil. Interesting. And if you have, so as you get older, you need to start swimming in olive oil. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so and I, nuts? I, I, have, I, have a, I have at least two, two dessert spoons, usually more like four every day. <laughs> Of, of just raw olive oil, which I've just put on my vegetables at night. Okay. And I love it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. There was an el elderly Japanese doctor who, I, who died a few years ago in his late 90s. But in his late 90s, he was running up, um, you know, his full 10 flights of stairs every day. And he swore by his olive oil, which he used to sort of have a drink of every morning. So, you know, there's at least a case of one where it's worked. <laughs> right. But, um, it, uh, <laughs> yeah. but in theory, um, having a high intake of olive oil should be the, one of the first steps to reducing inflammation. Okay. So because it will reduce inflammation in the cell, you know, it'll stop it early in the process. And then there are lots of other things um, that you then need to do to reduce inflammation. And that's a, that's a case of boosting up all your key defense enzymes that actually are your, you know, garbage removers. Yeah. Um, and so that, that's, that's really, really important. So on the, uh, I just want to touch on the olive oil for, for a, um, uh, for a non-cooking yeah. individual, will uh, the question yeah. for me is that does does cooking with it break it down, or is that still a good form, or is it better to no, eat it like yourself to pour it over uh, vegetables or yeah. something? Yeah, raw. Yeah, it, it it's not actually a very good cooking oil anyhow because it's um, because of the temperature at which it sort of 
heats. Okay. So um, it's it's something to put on your salads, but you can just put it on anything. You know? Okay. And uh, so and it really you must make sure you've got the extra virgin um, and that it hasn't been processed. It needs to be a you know a cold pressed oil, but a good really good quality. And there, there apparently have been some, you know, scam, scams going on in the world as around with everything that's good. And uh, <laughs> so, but apparently in America and in Australia, we have the best regulations on quality of olive oil. So we, okay. we should be all right. But okay. um, maybe there are other people listening elsewhere who need to be careful. And, uh, and it's very sad because some of the Italian oils are not as good as they should be because um, of, you know, some people wanting to make some money, money. on the way. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. So and now maybe. the other uh, mm -hmm. the other thing I think that we talked a little bit about the, uh, a few weeks ago was dis didn't some of your research lead uh, through Ireland? Wasn't there a group that did some research that was very interesting? Was it Scotland maybe? Or Scotland maybe. Oh, ah, 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 right, yes, yes, yeah. um, Scotland. Um, okay, so these are actually people who did the work. So when, so what happened to me was I was working along being a person who analysed chromosomes and analysed cell division and doing a lot of work um, <clears throat> in, in the reproductive area, really. So okay. I was sort of first, my first work was really... Um, it was partly because of the work I was doing, <clears throat> but I was very motivated to to understand what it was that seemed to suddenly happen when women were 40 that gave them a high risk of having a child with Down syndrome or lots of miscarriages, and then shortly after that, infertility. Um, <clears throat> and so I was interested, I, I had a few years where I didn't do any research at all. And then I was given the opportunity to do some research one day a week, but I didn't have any laboratory to actually do any research. So um, the only thing open to me was to analyze other people's data. So I researched, went through and researched the literature, what had been written, and to see whether anybody that looked at key changes in physiology that, had occur that were occurring uh, in that age group. Um, in women, but possibly in men as well. And so I, I came across, the only thing I could find um, was this brilliant and huge study that was done in Dundee in Scotland, um, where they had taken um, some, uh, just a little sample of fat from adipose tissue in the upper arm of, of a very large number of people, and they collected a lot of data about those people um, and so they had published um, you know, various graphs and when I looked at them I could see that that there were huge changes that were occurring in fat metabolism they were obviously starting around sort of age 40. Anyway I wrote to these people <clears throat> and I was very lucky um, to get a response um, from a person called um, Dr. Ro Roger Tavendale, who I have not had the pleasure of meeting in person. Mm -hmm. And he was kind enough to say he had done the laboratory work and that um, when he was able to, he was working in a different place at this stage in the same institution, I think. And he said that when he got back, he would try and find the data and actually send it to me. So with his um, the head of department's approval and with some removal of you know anything that I shouldn't have been aware of, um, I, I received data from all the women in the study and then I was able <clears throat> to analyze it in a different way and um, with the help of a statistician who knew what she was doing and um, to discover that in fact, what we were really looking at was, was changes in fat metabolism in each of the key, they're called omega groups of fatty acids. And, and you could see that what was happening was that there was um, 
a reduction in the conversion through in the, each of these fatty acid pathways that was that was starting at this time in middle age um, that was associated with reproductive problems. So from that was where I sort of then um, was able to start looking at cells and and being able to understand that this was really the key aspect of the key aspect underlay, underlying aging and how one thing was leading to the other that sort of these fatty acid changes would occur that they were occurring within all the cells and then <clears throat> these changes inevitably meant that the cells became inflammatory um, and underwent senescence. I should say that um, going back to the earliest stages when I was doing tissue culture in the early 1970s, was it you said? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there was a guy called Hayflick, um, and there's still a guy called Hayflick, I think, and I met him, I met him just a few years ago um, at a conference, but he, he realized that if you took the cells of a young person and you put them in culture, they could live in culture for a you know, certain number of generations. And then if you took the cells of a child, a baby, a child, and then an adult, that in culture, <clears throat> these cells would last less time the older the, the, the donor was. So the ones of the, the baby would last longest. And then by the time you took cells from sort of even a teenager, they weren't lasting a long time in culture. And he called this uh, phenomenon then the Hayflick limit. But, but I was able to use this sort of knowledge from back then to realize that <clears throat> it was when cells were reaching this Hayflick limit that they were becoming senescent. And then I was able to tie it in with the knowledge then that was around about telomeres and telomere structure and sort of make sense of it all. So um, in, in one way, I think why we age has got this theory together um, in, a, in a comprehensive way that I think is sort of able to be understood by, by most sort of um, people who you know, are in, interested. I know that I know that some of my good friends who have come up totally through the arts faculties were not interested in reading this section of the book. They like the other sections of the book, but they found this a bit heavy going. Yeah. But anyone who has a little bit of a science -y sort of bent um, finds this, this first part very interesting. Um, but some people have, have said, you know, it's, it's not easy going, you do have <laughs> to read it with care. And, and that's, um, and so then, yes, so because of all of this, um, I really want to change people's lives. And so that's why I then recently decided to create the workbook so that I could take the messages out of each of the chapters that I didn't think many people were actually taking home <laughs> and then put them in the workbook so it was possible to to really understand what I was getting at so I didn't want you just to understand the the theory I wanted you to understand how the theory could hopefully impact on you and improve your life and, and yeah. actions that you can take right I mean because it's never too late to start working on trying to um, you know like with the olive oil and all of that stuff, right? No, well, I think, um, you know, the, it, the later you get, the, the, the harder it is to make a big act, you know, impact. So obviously, if you're able to start earlier, you know, so if I could get people, but the trouble is people don't think about aging until they start aging. Until they start you know, aging. So they're not interested. <laughs> right. Um, right. Yeah, young young people think they're immortal, you know, <laughs> despite all evidence to the contrary, they think they're going to live forever. Yeah. Yes. Um, and it's really only when people start noticing, you know, so I'm sort of thinking, well, 
probably not many people under 40 are going to take much notice of this book, but I would love the 40-year-olds to really take it seriously yeah. because I think they could seriously change their lives. But really, you know, you really need to, you really need to start right from the word go. Yeah. However, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, I think, I think even at my old age, um, Oh, well, I think the message, there are many of the messages that are really important at every age. So, yeah. but, uh, yeah, probably you could have more impact if you took some of them earlier. Yeah. You so know, You might be able to stop, stop the arthritis and things if you started a bit earlier. Okay. Yeah, so our message will be that uh, contrary to your belief, you are going to grow old. So <laughs> you might as well go ahead and plan plan for it early. Yes. <laughs> right, right. So uh, yes. you did find yes. some interesting yes. information yes. about one of my favorite things to have on Saturday morning. <laughs> Wasn't uh, didn't uh, maple syrup? Is that am I correct oh, in that yeah. it played into your research somehow? Yeah, yeah. I thought maple syrup was important. So. Okay, so in the second part of the book, you know, and I'm using these world statistics, um, I looked at who in the world had the highest rates of various diseases. Mm -hmm. So in the case of stroke, um, the highest rates are in countries that have very, very high rates of infection. Right? So Indonesia, Sierra Leone, where there are there's there are countries where there's lots of flooding and there's lots of insect vectors and lots of infectious diseases, okay. you know. And we, we all know that when you when you travel to those countries you you're likely to get sick. Right. So so there are very high rates of infection. Now people haven't necessarily associated stroke with infection, but it's it's definitely a factor. There are probably other factors, um, but but infection is 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 probably one of them, or is almost certainly one of them. Yeah. Anyway, so what was the country in the world that had the lowest rate of stroke? And even it's reasonably high, but the lowest rate of stroke is in Canada, right? So. In my thinking about countries, <clears throat> so how does Canada stand out from everybody else? You know, there's a lot it has in common with with Australia, who still have a very high rate of stroke. Um, and um, but the one factor that to me stood out was maple syrup. So I thought, okay, so maple syrup. Um, now it, maple syrup has a reasonable amount of sugar in it so we don't want to eat too much maple syrup but what does maple syrup have in it that's really good for you and it turns out that it has two things um one is um, manganese and the other is one of the b group vitamins um and both of these are involved in some of the um what should we call them um the, the scavenger systems that that um, are getting rid of the inflammation. So I haven't really gone into what these systems are, <clears throat> but there are um, three enzymes which are called superoxide dismutase enzymes. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and these superoxide dismutase enzymes rely on you having the right amount of some micro components of your diet and manganese is one of these and so the superoxide dismutase that is most involved in strokes um, relies on manganese and manganese is is available in just about the right concentrations in a dessert spoon of maple syrup Oh, nice. So waffles it is okay. waffle, waffles olive, it is tomorrow. Olive yeah. oil and maple syrup. I'm not, I'm, mix. Not talking about, I'm not talking about a pint of maple syrup. <laughs> okay. I'm talking about, you know, just a, a spoonful or yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, but I must admit, you know, I believe my own rhetoric. So I've been, I've been having my maple syrup in the last ever since I read the book. You know, so yeah. Yeah, and I think you, uh, you did say you have to be careful. It has to be true, authentic maple syrup, not a factory Absolutely. recreation, yeah. in order to have the right ingredients. Yeah. 
And look, these, um, these elements that we need, um, the, the other two are copper and zinc and, and mag or magnesium as well and manganese, <coughs> we need for the function of these dismutase enzymes. Um, you know, they're trace elements. So they're, they're the things that are called trace elements. And one of the problems these days is that um, with the reuse of soil and the overgrowth with agriculture, um, we're, we're, we're probably deficient in a lot of these trace elements. And yet we, and that's why we're getting so much increase in, it's one of the reasons why we're getting so much increase in a lot of diseases. Yeah. But they are trace elements, so we don't want to take too much of them. So it's just sort of getting it right. And that's why I think it's better if you can eat foods that that have, you know, enough of them in without sort of taking them as extras. Yeah. So it's a tricky one. And the other, um, the my my major well, my major sort of um, detoxifier is um, a chemical called glutathione, which is our glutathione system. So we have these <clears throat> these other systems that work mostly through the mitochondria and and which are our energy systems and they're sort of our very much our earlier cleanup and then our real sort of total garbage collector cleaner is glutathione and that requires um, a lot of sulfur and so if we don't have enough sulfur in our diet then the sulfur is taken out of our cartilage and that causes us to have osteoarthritis. Oh, wow. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. And so when we look at um, studies that are done on old horses, for instance, you know, old horses like old people um, <laughs> get osteoarthritis. <laughs> and so they've been able to show that the amount of sulfur in the cartilage is is reduced by a good 30 percent or more yeah. with aging wow. so we need to have <clears throat> an intake of foods that that have high amounts of sulfur um and unfortunately um the foods that we used to eat um a lot of offal offal <laughs> yeah. offal uh, so eggs <clears throat> so some of the foods that have a lot of sulfur in them are eggs Awful, almost all awful, but fortunately for me, um, seafood—not fish so much, some fish—but um, so um, prawns, mollusks, lobsters, shellfish, um, shrimp, all those sorts of things. And I, and I like—we call them prawns. I think you call them shrimp. I, I like to have them. I I buy a, a small amount. I have them. On Fridays and Saturdays, that's my my prawn prawn days of the week. <laughs> but I also take a supplement of sulfur um, okay. called MSM, and don't ask me what that stands for because I always <laughs> get a bit wrong. Um, but that's a form of organic sulfur, and you'll know that um, a lot of uh, people have promoted taking glucosamine and chondroitin. Mm -hmm. Now, they are also promoted because they are components of cartilage that have sulfur in them. But they are very large molecules and they are reasonably poorly absorbed by the body. So the body absorbs um, organic sulfur better. Okay. So MSM um, is a better, a better source of um, sulfur. Okay. It's also good, you know, to get to get it from food, but I don't think you get enough from food yeah. mostly to support these, you know, yeah, aging, and one, heavy legs. One, yeah, one thing, too, so. that, uh, you know, we, we use ourselves is there are a lot of apps or computer programs that will look at a lot of these micronutrients like you're talking about. So, you know, my advice is mm -hmm. always to, uh, you know, get a... Um, get just enter your food into these for a few days it'll give you a really a good idea yeah yeah it'll give you a really good view and like we've done you know we see where we are short on some micronutrients that we need to you know beef up and usually it turns out it's you know in the greens the spinaches the kales things like that mm -hmm. that have a lot of these yeah. 
good yeah. nutrients. So anyway, I just always recommend that way you know what your your intake is, and it's always better to intake through the natural through the, through the foods organics. yeah and then uh you can always go to your doctor and show them what your nutrient levels are based on your diet and then you know they can help you adjust that if necessary yeah, yeah. i'm not sure <clears throat> whether doctors are all i mean depending on who you go to if you go to somebody who's a really specialist nutritionist mm -hmm. they probably quite good yeah but I, I I think that a lot of you know a lot of our everyday doctors probably don't know very much about nutrition yeah. I know when I <clears throat> I mean and this is this is probably an awful thing to say but when I worked at the hospital at which I worked with not naming um, and I worked there for 20 years and uh, when when you went at lunchtime and you looked at who was buying what it was really quite funny because the people who bought the worst food, um, were the doctors. doctors. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, 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 they were buying all the fatty sort of pies and things. Um, and the people who were buying the best food were the scientists. Right? Yeah. So, oh. and, and then the, oh, and the nurses were pretty awful too. Yeah. And, and in the days of smoking, you know, the, the smoking by nurses and doctors was just amazing. So, um, I, I haven't, I haven't got a really excellent view of, of, of at least the past nutrition and, <laughs> and behavior of doctors. Yeah. Well, and you might be all completely reformed right now. But, yeah, you know, yeah and, and uh, it's always good, too. You can reach out to a registered dietitian. I think mm -hmm. they have a lot of yeah. the well, uh, educational background for that as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So then, one and I mean, they're very motivated about food and and also they're motivated about helping you get that balance that right. will will work for you. So I think, yeah. yes, I think the dietitian yeah. is probably the better yeah. option. So yeah. I, I do have a question that what you talked about earlier, the um, on the infection leading to stroke. I just wonder, was that like an immediate reaction? Like I get the infection and then I have a stroke or is this that people that may have got some infection 10 or 15 years ago that makes them more susceptible to stroke as they get older? Was there any delineation in that in the research? Good question. Uh, good question. Oh, you, uh, look, there's an awful lot of research on stroke and I, I, I'm no expert. Mm -hmm. One thing I can tell you <clears throat> is that there is a strong association with dental health and stroke yes. and susceptibility to stroke. And so if you've got poor dental health, you've got ragingly high numbers of microorganisms in your mouth. Right. And of course, if you have poor gum health, those organisms get into your bloodstream. Right. So, you know, so we're not necessarily talking about having something that's, you know, a one diagnosable infection, but we might be talking about having a very high load of a variety of, of okay. bacteria okay. in your system. Okay. Yeah, and you know, that's mm -hmm. one where in the, the states that we are very deficient with the older population is delivering, you know, the, the proper amount of dental care. Yeah. And like you said, it yeah. is, it, it's a place that, uh, I, you know, if I remember my science correctly, I think that uh, a heart disease can even start in your mouth as well. Absolutely, yeah. and it can, and it can definitely be caused. There are definitely some forms of cardiovascular disease that are caused by infection. Yeah. Look, it's. Uh, I think you know in Australia, um, we we've been there is there's we've got we've had a you know a, a, a funded. A government funded medical system for a very long time yeah and that's great in that you can go to the doctor but it is not funding dental care right and it's very there's a there's a little bit of dental care funded now but and there have been some childhood dental programs from time to time yeah but but we should be funding dental care because in many ways it's more important than funding medical care. Correct, you know, it's correct. A, it's a first level, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
All right, Dr. Judy. Well, we're going to wrap up. Uh, we do appreciate your time very much. And so uh, tell people how they can reach out to either yourself or uh, if they want to pick up a copy yeah, of the but... Why We Age or the Why We Age workbook, how could they do that? Right. Well, um, one way to reach out to me is to come to my website, uh, which is drjudyford.com now. Um, so that's sort of easy, easy to find. Um, they can buy the book, Why We Age, um, on either Amazon okay. or on Google Books or from me. They can have a signed copy, but I don't have an automated sort of purchasing system. They okay. can also buy the workbook from me and I'd love to, but I have to post it to them. So I, yeah. you know, so I have to do it manually and I have to work out you know, how much it would cost. But um, I would love to, love to hear from people, love for them to buy my book, but certainly Why We Age, easily available on Amazon or Google Books. Okay. But and I'll probably put the workbook um, up on those sites too, but I haven't yet. Okay. So the workbook has only just been completed. Um, I had some friends help me with editing it, and so it's really only in its final version in the last couple of days. But um, I will I will probably put that also on Amazon, um, and then that's probably the easiest way okay. for a lot of people to get it. The, wor okay. the workbook, I must say, um, was the, you sent it to me, and I was very appreciative of that because my pea brain, my, my head is spinning with all the this, this scientific stuff, but I'm following you. I'm just being quiet because I'm processing. Yeah. <laughs> but I enjoyed the work bit, the workbook. Um, it, it was easy easy to understand for my lay, yeah. lay pea brain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, don't put yourself down because, <laughs> you know, this is very, uh, and there's a lot of heavy, uh, I, well, not a lot of heavy science, but it covers a lot of territory. You know, there's a lot, yes. of, a lot of information in it. And that's yeah. why I decided, look, I could easily pick out the key points and put them in the workbook. Yeah. And I was really pleased with the workbook yes. when I finished it. I thought this is this is this is much more accessible. <laughs> yeah. Um, but not only is it more likely that people will actually get the take home messages and do something about it, but I think it's it's got almost all the elements in it that you need to understand, you know. So I think that uh, the why we ate the full book is is great if you really want to understand the whole concept of, of aging that I'm thinking about. Uh, but if you really just want to get the take home elements, then the work is good. Okay. All right. And what is your, uh, can you tell us your website again and we'll be sure and put it in our show notes. Yes. Yeah, so it's, yes, yeah, thank you. So it's just, just all one word, drjudyford.com. Okay. And it's D-R, or is a doctor spelled out? Yeah, D-R, yeah, just okay. D-R-J-U-D-Y. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Dr. Judy, uh, thanks so much again. Great information. Y'all reach out and get Why We Age or and or the Why We Age workbook when it gets yes. available. Uh, you know, it's good stuff to learn. Just little simple things like the olive oil. And it also, uh, if you read the background, it also helps us understand, you know, why things happen to us. And then uh, we can take better care of ourselves. hopefully is the message there so and spread the word yeah <laughs> all right well yeah. that's going to do it for another episode of educational uh we do appreciate it again we are on all the major uh podcast platforms you can look us uh check us out on itunes google podcast uh stitcher spotify amazon uh all the major ones if we're not on one that you use please reach out we'd love to add you also, we're always looking for, uh, you know, interesting guests, uh, professionals in the field, such as Dr. Judy. Uh, if you are a senior that, you know, has, uh, has a story about your aging process, if you're a caregiver or an adult child, you know, we would love to hear from you and see about airing your story. So reach out to one of us, Roy at ageducational.com or Terry with a Y at educational.com we'd be glad to talk to you so Dr. also Judy thank you so much yeah. 
also Sorry. again Thank we you. we are um, on uh, we are at uh, www.educational.com all the major uh, social media platforms as well as this will go uh, when the episode goes live we will have this on youtube as well so Again, thanks, ladies. Certainly do appreciate it. Appreciate your time, Dr. Judy, and uh, hopefully we'll talk again very soon. Yes, ma'am. Thanks, ma'am. All right. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. All righty.